Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Jenny Lee Hodgins here. I'm your host at the New and Returning Piano Learners Facebook group. Uh, go let me know if you're joining me, hashtag live or hashtag replay. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you've got questions or comments or tips as we go through today's uh, topic, please go ahead and plop that in the comments. I'll come back and check them throughout and definitely at the end. And when I finish, I always go back. So if you catch me on the replay, don't hesitate to ask questions or add comments or tips or ideas. Uh, today, I wanted to um, respond to one of my our group members, Rob, who had requested some ideas on composing. So I'm going to talk about how to get your creative flow for composing at the piano, some ideas. Um, so, you know, when I struggle with creative flow, I go back to some philosophical um, points first to kind of get my mindset in the right spot. So I'm going to share some of those tips. And if you struggle with creative flow or you're new to it, you know, and you want to try some things out at the piano, I have a few ideas for you today. And these should help you uh, connect with your true self and your open heart, which to me are both crucial for expressing yourself through music. Um, so I'm going to do three things today. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about learning to be creative and, and how to get in that mindset. So a few tips for you that I use that work pretty well. Um, secondly, I'm going to give you a couple of approaches for composing at the piano, specifically in piano language. <laughs> um, and thirdly, I'm going to give you some examples of my creative process uh, and some examples of music that I've composed and what my ideas were for how I wanted to accomplish that and how it turned out. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you know, hurl any comments or questions or uh, tips if you've got them along the way too. And if you catch it later, go ahead and, and add that in too. Um, we can learn from each other. So um, first of all, I'm going to give you um, some tips on, or at least the tips that I use for getting creative. So sometimes we lose our way um, we kind of get blocked. Uh, we block ourselves a little bit. Or sometimes we just need some help getting connected to that creative side. And so here's some things that I've learned about how to be imaginative, how to get yourself in that in that mindset, in that space to sit down and compose or be creative. First of all, um, what I do is I just give up caring about the end result. I don't care what it sounds like. I'm just experimenting. So you can think about how it turns out later. Uh, to get your creative juices going, um, let go of those expectations. Just, you know, once you can loosen up on that, the real source of originality is going to become accessible. So don't care about the result or the outcome. Um, take off your head. Don't think about structure or rules or what you know. Once you start creating, now, now sometimes I, I will give you some ideas on setting up a structure or setting up a template or setting up some limitations. But once you have that in place, take off your head, don't think about that structure or the rules or anything that you know, knowledge wise. Um, and if you start thinking or judging your ideas, just throw that judgment into an imaginary balloon and send it off into the sky. Goodbye. <laughs> um, the next thing to kind of set up your your mindset for being creative is to tap into your heart, you know, your soul, what you believe in or what you care about and let everything come from that inner compass. And once you can really channel directly from your core, from your purpose, your spirituality or your unique truth, that's going to freely spill out once you can really be, be still with yourself and really listen to what your heart wants to say to you. So just tap into your heart and listen to yourself. And the more you connect with your inner voice or spirituality or faith or whatever it is, the more readily your pure, you know, yet wiser self is going to lead the way. So just follow your intuition. Once that starts, just follow it, you know, with kind of a curiosity, just go where it goes and let your journey take you where you're going. You don't have to know where you're going to end up. Just be confident it's going to be someplace really cool. And as you're approaching your creativity, open up your courage. You know, ad I address my creativity as kind of an adventure into a deeper existence. So I, I listen and I pay attention and I follow. And I just go forward with humility. I let my ego go and I, I just go with the spirit to learn and to be true to myself and just go forth with willingness to be led and to be taught um, don't, don't, um, I don't like to, you know, start my creativity with knowledge or theory or what I know. I like to lead with curiosity. And if you lose your focus and you begin to feel limits due to your ego, just shake it off 
and reconnect to the primary purpose, communicating with your creative life um, and communicating through your creativity to reach a connection with others. To me, that's like the, you know, one of the, the things that I really focus on. And setting aside time to explore creative adventure is not only healthy and enriching for you, but it's going to lead to your creative development. And the more you give your creative life, the greater the energy it will ignite. So this is kind of how I set up my creative mindset as I approach composing at the piano. Let me know if these suggestions are helpful. Um, or if you have more tips for tapping creativity, leave a comment for us. <clears throat> and now I'm going to jump into talking about two different approaches really to composing for piano. And by the way, um, what I just mentioned, the tips on creativity, these come from a blog I've written. So I'm going to drop that link below. So if you'd like to read through those tips again, to refresh your memory when you want to sit down and be creative. And same thing with what I'm about to share with um, tips on composing for piano. I have a blog on that and I'll drop that link too. So if you'd like to read through them a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm today I'm just going to talk about two different approaches for composing at the piano. Um, just ideas to give, give you some way to get started if you'd like to try composing at the piano. One way is an improvisational way, and that's just to generate free-flowing ideas. You know, that's the improvisational approach. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the other way is to create kind of a, blue, a blueprint based either loosely or strictly on music theory using form or, a, you know, key signature or tempo or range or, or melodic motives or themes. So these are two very different ways that I sometimes use to compose at the piano, either just improvising just to see what comes up, or I set a blueprint, I set parameters. So, <clears throat> and if you have any questions, as I mentioned throughout, go ahead and let me know in the comments and I'll come back to them too, in case I don't see, I know there's a little delay. So, one thing you can do, we'll start with the improvis improvisational approach to composing. <clears throat> One thing you can do is determine a chord progression and just start really simple. So for example, um, because I know we have some new, new um, piano learners in here. We also have returning piano learners who've never improvised or never composed. And one of the things you can do is just start, start really simple and do in C major, which has no sharps or flats, and use the chord progression C, A minor, F major, G7, which is your typical heart and soul chord progression. If you can't remember that order, you can write it down. And, and as I mentioned, this is in a blog, so you'll see these later. <clears throat> and uh, basically, you're going to practice playing. So you're going to play each chord's bass, home tone, C, A, F, and G with your left hand. And maybe the chord triad itself in your right hand. And you'll play each chord bass tone for maybe one measure. And then you're just going to experiment with that parameter using rhythm only to alter the feel of the groove of the progression. So for example, I'll just give an example of it right now. Here's what it might sound like. Sorry for my setup here, but... <clears throat> I'm just making sure you can see me. So so that was just C, A, F, G in the left hand. And then you can just improvise by just playing that um, bass pattern over and over again. You know, four beats each letter name, four beats for each chord. And then once you get the bass, then you can add the right hand triads or the chords of those progressions. So it'd be C major, A minor, F major, G major, for example. <clears throat> So that's your basic progression. And then if you want to improvise with it, <clears throat> start simply by just keeping that progression going and just play with the rhythm of the chord in your right hand. So for example, or you can do arpeggios with your right hand, for example. And 
then as you get going, maybe just start, keep your right hand in C major because it's all no sharps, no flats, and keep that left hand thing going. And just see if you can play with the rhythm in your right hand using only those five tones, but keep that rhythm going. It might help too if you use a metronome or um, a drum track, for example. <clears throat> So all I'm doing is just making up stuff, <laughs> basically, just using my right hand <clears throat> to just stay in that key, C major, and play with the rhythm of C, D, E, F, and G with my right hand. And you can go slow. You can do the same thing with chords. Instead of doing melody with my right hand, you could do that C, A, F, major, G, you know, the bass line in the left hand. And just play the chords in the right hand, but do some rhythm activity with those chords. So I'll try to do that and just give an example <laughs> off the top of my head. <clears throat> So I just started out by doing some rhythm with the chords in my right hand, and then I just felt like, ah, let's add a little bit of melody to it. So just go where, where your ear leads you or go where the groove feel, you know, leads you. And I recommend starting slow. I'm just trying to give you some ideas off the top of my head. But just to recap, <clears throat> if you want to start learning to compose at the piano, there are two ways that I use improvisational, which is what I'm talking about right now, and using a blueprint, which I'm going to share in a second. And for improvisational, start really simple. And I'm just giving you a simple example, starting the C major using C, A, F, and G in your left hand, and then C major, A minor, F major, and G major chords. And if all you do is get used to playing that, you know, the chords in the right hand and the bass in the left hand at a steady beat, that's a really good start. And then slow it down a little bit and see if you can play with just using maybe two notes, C and D, or C and E, whatever, pick two notes, C and G in your right hand, and only use those two notes to see if you can improvise over that bass. And I'll give an example. I'll, I'll see if I can do it. <laughs> <clears throat> So just using two notes, C and G in my right hand, I just keep that bass note going, or that bass line going, and just come up with some kind of rhythmic thing. And and there is no right or wrong, so you could just stay on C for the whole time and just done different rhythm, and it would still be okay. You're improvising. You're just being free with it and seeing where it leads you. So this is kind of... Um, a way to experiment with improvising at the piano using a very simple, you know, parameter or uh, structure and use rhythm only. Don't worry about the melody. And then once you get used to the rhythm and, and used to that progression or that bass line, then you can add chords and do some rhythm with the chords like I did. And then you can add maybe trying to do some melody with just the five notes, um, or start with three notes and then expand it maybe to five notes. And eventually you'll get comfortable and you'll be able to kind of use that whole scale, C major scale, to improvise a melody over that progression. So that's one way that you could maybe play around with improvising at the piano to get some ideas for composing. I hope that makes sense. If you've got questions, hurl it at me. Um, as I mentioned, once you've mastered that chord progression, C, A, F, G, and, you know, the bass line is mastered and you're able to keep it going. You can drop the chord triads from your right hand and use your right hand to play around with the notes in the C major scale while you're continuing to play your left hand bass line progression, which I just did, if, if that makes sense. 
sometimes for me, I like to use a, a DAW, which is a digital audio workstation. <clears throat> and I have something called Logic Pro. Um, and it has really cool drum loops in it. So I'll turn a drum loop on. Uh, sometimes just regular keyboards have them just to give a groove. And um, I just hit that and listen to the beat. And it gives me kind of some inspiration for rhythm and, and, and accents and things like that. But I recommend starting slow so you can, <laughs> so you don't get ahead of yourself. And I play along with that for tempo and for rhythmic phrasing and for the groove. I like to let the drum track kind of give me some ideas. And then Sometimes I'll even record when I'm improvising using that drum track. And then later, later I might just delete the drum track and leave only the piano improvisation. It's really kind of fun to, to do that. And then sometimes um, that will give me ideas. I'll go back and listen to it and think <laughs> some of it might sound like really raw, not so great. But, but I might hear some ideas in there that I like. And then I might pull those out and start something else from that. So these are ways, you know, some ideas that can come out of improvising at the keyboard. Um, anyway, and as I mentioned, you can also alternate between playing chords and the melody to make things a little more varied. So I'm going to try that a little bit. I haven't uh, improvised in a while, but I'm going to try C, A minor, G, uh, F major, G, major progression which is the heart and soul progression if you don't know that what that song is that's what I'm using it's from heart and souls it's this you know that song so I'm going to improvise <clears throat> So what I'm doing there is trying to show you that you can start really simple with C major chord and just get the bass line and then add some triads on the top and then just isolate a couple of notes for the melody and maybe two notes like C and G and play with the rhythm while you keep that left hand thing going and then you can expand that into trying to keep the left hand going and maybe make up some kind of a melody with your right hand. And then you can, or you can just do chords. As you're playing the left hand, you can just do the chords, which is what I started out doing in this uh, example. And then you can mix it all together. You can do some chords, you can do a little bit of melody. Um, I wasn't really paying attention to my fingering, so I kind of got stuck. When I could hear I wanted to go up higher with the melody, but I ended on my fifth finger, so I was kind of stuck there. So to avoid that problem, I could have gone a lot slower, but I'm trying to get through this quickly so I can give you an, an example. But, um, you know, I just wanted to give you some ideas on simple things that you can do. Start simply, get really comfortable with those basic things that I just mentioned, and then you can incrementally you can add more to it but don't add more until you're comfortable <clears throat> and then <clears throat> another thing you can do since you're specifically interested in composing at the piano is you can practice specific piano styles um, you know you can use the same basic improvisational exercises like I mentioned to practice specific styles so instead of doing the C A F G bass line like I did you could do it with a walking bass and practice that a walking bass is something like <laughs> Thank you.
out. I just realized I skipped a minor. <laughs> but um, but basically, you would just use the same uh, bass line that I gave you, C, A minor, F major, G major, and use a walking bass instead of just the bass line itself. I mean, just the tone, uh, home tone of each chord. Instead of just C, it'd be C, E, G, A, B flat, A, G. And then you go to the next key and do the same progression in, in a walking bass style. So once you get the walking bass style going uh, and you practice that and you get real comfortable with it, you can do the same things that we just mentioned. You know, play just the chords or just keep your hand in a five finger position and play with the rhythm. See if you can fit something in to the walking bass. <clears throat> Another thing you can do, which we kind of talked about a little bit, is use arpeggios instead of playing the block chords. With the right hand, you could use arpeggios, C, E, G, instead of uh, uh, one note at a time as an arpeggio, instead of as a block chord, and play with the rhythm of it. Um, <clears throat> we, we've just started out with using triads, but you could also um, use octaves, and I did that a little bit at the end of that last um, time I improvised the left hand. <clears throat> excuse me, I used low octaves with my left hand instead of just playing the C one note. I played a C octave and then an A octave and then an F octave. Um, so you can mix it up a little bit. You can, and I also added some color tones. I added sevenths and ninths um, as I continued. And if you don't know what those are, you don't need to add them yet. But um, as you get more comfortable with improvising with basic triads or basic arpeggios, <clears throat> which is the scale degrees one, three, and five, you can then add one, three, five, seven, or um, one, nine, three, and five, um, you know, or the 11th chord tone or the 13th chord tone or the sixth chord tone, um, just to jazz up, you know, they're called color chords because they give it a little more, um, distinction <clears throat> and, um, color in the sound basically than just a plain triad. So these are things that you can do, um, you know, to practice improvising in specific piano styles, you know, to recap, basically just do the bass line and add one or two notes in the right hand, play with the rhythm. Then try the triads with the right hand using different rhythms. Then <clears throat> use one or two simple notes from that major scale. And I, in my case, I started out doing C and G, and I just used only two notes to create a melody by messing around with the rhythm in my right hand. <clears throat> and then you can... Um, add full chords, add colors to the chords, um, add arpeggios, um, add um, color chords such as the 7th, the ninth, the 11th, the 13th, or the 6th chord tones of these chords. Different things or octaves. Um, you can play around with different pianistic things just to make it interesting. Just an idea. Um, so you can just repeat that chord progression, that same basic chord progression, C, A, F, G, using one more or more or all of those uh, piano techniques, basically. And these are some ideas that I use for improvising outside the jazz tradition, because I'm not a jazz musician. Um, and of course, you can pick your own chord progressions if you want more challenging, intriguing, or fresh music, create your own. So this is one approach to <clears throat> that I use for just improvising at the piano. There's There are other things that I do, but I just wanted to come in with something real simple from the get-go for you. And to compose by blueprint, um, this is this is sometimes what I do when I'm composing. For that, I, um, I sometimes use my digital audio workstation to record in. Other times I use just plain old manuscript paper and pencil. Um, I often use p paper and pencil. And what I do is I think first, what kind of limitations am I going to give myself? I set out some parameters, some structure. So for example, I'll say, I want to make some music that has an A section and a completely different B section. And then I want that to repeat. So the form would be A, B, A, B. Um, or I might uh, decide I'm going to do that and then I'm going to add a completely new bridge section or a C section. So A, B, A, B, C, and then I'll come back and repeat B a couple times. So this is a common pop song format. It's, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus. Um, so the, the point is that I pick some kind of a form or structure of how I want it to 
what my limitations are and how I want the music to go. Sometimes it'll be A, A, B, B. Boom. And that's just to set, um, kind of give myself limitation of where I'm going. Because when I first started composing, I would just ramble all over the place. <laughs> and it was just very, um, <clears throat> I don't know what the, long-winded. And I needed some structure. So um, I set myself a box. To, you know, I give myself a limit of what kind of form I want to use. And sometimes I'll simply choose four measures or eight measures or 16 measures. And that's going to be my A section. And then I equal that, whatever it is, 4, 8, or 16, and I make a B section. <clears throat> so I, I try to keep things pretty symmetrical in terms of form or structure, uh, just because it helps my brain. <laughs> and uh, so I start out with a bar, uh, I mean, a section of 16 measures or bars, and then I follow that with a 16 bar section called the B section. Or you can limit it to eight or four bars, you know, start simple. Um, it, I do think that even numbers of bars seems to feel better for most contemporary music, <clears throat> unless you're, um, you know, a, a real advanced jazz improviser, or uh, I just think it works better that way. Alternately, and something that I've done is you can, if you're not sure how to pick a form or a structure, sometimes I have taken some of my favorite pop songs because, um, chord progressions or the form of the song is not copywritten. So... I'll take a favorite song um, and I'll copy the form of it, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, um, or if there's a bridge in it, you know, add that. Um, or I'll take just, well, I'm going to go a little further, a little more advanced level. What I've done is I've taken favorite song lyrics and I'll use the lyrics as the basis for, I have to follow that rhythm and meter of the lyrics to create a melody. And then after I've created the melody, of course, I don't use the lyrics because that's not my lyrics, <laughs> but I use it as a form or as a structure or as a limitation or a parameter to work from, if that makes sense. This is my blueprint. <clears throat> Once I have a form or a structure, the next thing I, I do when I'm using a blueprint approach to composing is I determine a harmonic progression. So if you've got a form picked out for your music and you've mapped it out, a, B, A, B, or A, B, A, B, C, B, B, or just A, A, B, B, whatever it is, then I determine a chord progression for one of those sections. And you can even use a, a, a familiar pop song if you want to, to um, literally copy the chord progression from the verse of that song, um, because chord progressions are not, co are not copywritten. And then you can create a melody over that uh, progression um, uh, you know, if you want to really be creative, create your own chord progression, but these are great ways to start with a blueprint and get in the idea of giving yourself structure and good, uh, pop songs or standards, jazz standards that have stood the test of time are really great to use as practice for composing. So, um, and then, so you start out with that chord progression and you, and you just create some little chord progression for your A section. And then the B section, usually I'll go to the dominant or the fifth of the scale to change the key, to give it a little more excitement, change the key to the dominant chord or something else uh, to be less predictable. Sometimes uh, you'll go to the relative minor, the sixth scale degree, because it's less predictable to have a, a deceptive cadence there. So it, the B section sounds different from the A section because you're changing the key a little bit. Um, so, so just a little detail on that. So if, if you, if the A section uses that C major progression we did earlier, C, A, F, G, then the B section would start on the fifth scale degree of C major, which would be, which would be G. So then we're going to start on G major, or if you want to do a deceptive cadence, you'd start on A minor, which is the minor sixth of C major. I know this is a lot of music theory I'm just hurling at you, but, uh, for those of you who know that, <laughs> there you go. Um, and then when you finish that B section in the new key, whether it's the fifth, the dominant G major, <clears throat> or the relative minor, the, the sixth, the A minor key, when you come back to the A section again, because your form is, let's say, A, B, A, B, when you come back to that A section again, you're going to go back to your original C major key. So these are just things to think about in advance as you're setting up a parameter or limitations or structure 
for how you want to compose, for example. Another thing you can do is discover melodic motives. So once you've got your form and your key and your chord progressions, and they're kind of drafted out and you know what you're boxed in with, and that might change depending on how the mood's moving you and the melody might change it for you. But be flexible and go where your musical ideas take you. Once you've got it mapped out, you can use notes within that chord progression or the key of C in this case. <clears throat> and you can play around with melodic motives or melodic themes or phrases that fit in with that C major um, key. A good rule of thumb is to make something and then repeat it and then change it just a little bit. So the form would be A, there's your melody, A again, same melody, and there it is again, but you change it just a little bit. So you've done it three times because people like, you know, when, when we're listening to music, we like a little bit of repetition, but we don't want it verbatim repetition. So, you know, sometimes the three rule is nice. You do this one thing, you repeat it, and then you do it one more time, but do a little bit of twist to it, something a little bit different. Because our ears like patterns, or they like, you know, repetition, but not too much. Uh, so this is something you can do and just continue in that A section to come up with little melodic motives and lines to complete your A section by repeating it and doing something a little bit different. <clears throat> and then you can change to that new key in the B section and play around with creating a new motive and line and melody that's a completely different one in a different key and a completely different idea than the A section. And the point of that is the B section is different from the A section. That's why it's not the A section. <laughs> Um, so, for example, if and by the way, this is in a blog form. So if if I'm if you're forgetting what I'm saying or you want to go back and look at it, I'll drop the links below and you can read through the blog and it'll give it to you in black and white a little more easily. But if you've used a lot of busy or fast melodic short lines, for example, in the A section, maybe in the B section you use slower, longer rhythmic phrases with lots of rests and breathing space, so they're different. So that's the goal. They're trying to be different. Or if your A section notes are really low, then use higher range notes within the B section. Um, another idea for creating the melodic motive is to limit the amount of melodic notes used. So use two or three notes. That's it. And focus more on the rhythmic patterns of those limited notes, which is what we did in the very beginning of this live. And I started out just using C and G in my right hand and doing nothing but rhythm with those two notes. Um, and think of, for this idea, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, ba -ba -ba -ba. you know, he only used two notes and like just a few um, rhythmic durations, but he built an entire symphony around that theme. He was, he was the master at doing that, taking very small snippets of an idea and just developing them to death. <laughs> and he really made uh, incredibly great music by doing that. So don't overwhelm yourself by thinking your melodic line has to be really long or complicated. It does not. It can be very simple. Um, and there's so many things you can do. And, uh, you know, I could talk about this like all day long, but I'd like to hear from you. Let me know if this is helpful, if it empowers you to try some things at the piano to compose. And let me know, you know, take take a moment to um, join the conversation. Let me know in, in the comments below if if this is helpful if you have any questions or if you have any tips to share on composing and if you are a piano teacher um, also please feel free to share one of your favorite piano tips in the comments too and the next thing I wanted to share is um, sorry I'm trying to see my notes here for you and I will go back and 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 answer questions or check your comments too I just my computer's been funky <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to plow ahead the third thing, so, so we've gone through how to get yourself in the mindset of being creative at the piano or in general, and we've gone through two different approaches for composing, improvising versus kind of a blueprint or um, I set limitations or parameters or a structure to work from, and I've given you some ideas there. And now I'm going to give you a little bit of some examples of my creative process and just give you some ideas on how you might hopefully that might jog some ideas for you and inspire you towards your music. And I'll drop the links after this to the specific musical pieces I'm talking about so you can hear it and you know what I'm talking about. So first of all, what moves me to write music is usually life events, um, friendship, 
Um, I've been through a lot of loss in my life. Um, so the eternity of life, um, and those kinds of things. So I've written a lot of music for friends and I've also composed music for, um, musical theater, uh, productions, um, both for children and for seniors through different things. And I've also composed some film scores. So depending on what I'm doing, I'm inspired in different ways. And, but I really look at it kind of in a similar way. I do both of my approaches. I set parameters and then I improvise. I come up with ideas. I let myself be free. So for example, when I'm approaching the piano, sometimes what I'll do um, is just sit and listen and see if I hear something instead of just playing, you know, the instrument, I sit for a minute, I might play one chord, you know, just to kind of see what if it jives me and, and, and if I like that key. And then I'll, I'll sit for a minute. And, and I listen to my heart. And I listen to, I try to tap into what, what does my true self want to say? Um, and sometimes I'll let the melody come to me. And then I'll try to once I hear it, then I'll try to find it on the keyboard. And sometimes that leads me right away into the next phrase. And if I get stuck, I don't know where to go next. I repeat that process. I just sit quietly. I listen to it. I try to let my voice speak to me, my musical voice. Um, and it's coming from my heart. It's coming from what is it that I want to express. Um, instead of, in other words, I don't approach it with, musical theory or knowledge. Okay, I'm in the key of C, so I'm going to use this. And no, I don't think that way. I might have set it up that way with a blueprint. But once I start to compose, I listen to my heart, you know, and, and I try to hear the music come to me. Alternately, instead of using a melody, I might, um, I might start with a, a chord progression and kind of feel around with whatever key I'm in and try to play uh, a few things. And Sometimes um, that will lead, I'll hear something, I'll hear, I'll hear a color, or I'll hear something rising, or I'll hear something uh, descending, and I'll look for it, you know, on the keyboard and try to find what I'm hearing. Um, but I lead by listening for what I hear versus making a sound first. Um, so let me give an example of that. For my father, uh, my my father passed away in 2014, and uh, I lived in Florida until recently. I've moved up to Kentucky to be a caregiver for my mom. And he, we, about a year or so before he passed away from cancer, he would say how he really wanted to come back and visit me in Florida, and he would love to come see the ocean again. He never did because, you know, he passed away. But I composed a piece of music for him before he passed away. And my intent, as I listened to my heart, was I wanted to bring the ocean to my dad. And so... How do you do that with music? <laughs> and so what I did is I wanted it to feel like ocean waves, soothing ocean waves for him. And so I I did what I talked about at the beginning of this live. I set just a simple drum track inside my, my Logic Pro. Equally, you could just set the metronome on a keyboard. And I just um, picked a key. I can't remember. I think it was E minor. And I just improvised I created a progression a chord progression and then I decided to just keep repeating the same chord progression and to me that loop of repetitive the same chord progression over and over again was to me kind of like the repetitive waves coming and going and then I just improvised a piano melodic line over that and then I created a new track and I played that back to hear it. And I improvised another line using a, a, a classical guitar sound. So I had these overlapping uh, guitar and piano sounds with a repetitive looping chord progression. And that I called it ocean waving. And so uh, that's the piece that I com composed for my dad. And I'm going to drop that those links to these as you hear me describe it. It might be good for you to hear the oral picture, what it sounds like. So I'll drop that. Another thing I did, um, is, as you know, in my practice, I've been working on a piece called Sun and Bloom. Um, and I, I wrote this piece for my friend Kay and another one called Finding Spring. Sun and Bloom is this. <laughs> <clears throat> so 
So that's a piece that I wrote for a friend of mine, Kay. It's called Sun and Bloom, and there's a partner piece to it called Finding Spring. And I just recently made that available for purchase on my website. They're both of them together for uh, $10 if you want to check that out. But what I did is um, she's such a good friend, and she's just always been so supportive of my creative life. And she's, you know, we just used to hang out and drink wine and she'd ask me to play her piano and I'd just sit around and improvise or write music or play stuff that I'd done before. And she just always um, made me feel um, encouraged about myself, about being creative and who I really am. So I wanted to give her something in, in return. So I wrote those two pieces as an expression of cheerful gratitude, you know, for my, our friendship. So... <clears throat> you know, to, to, to get that, um, feeling to her when I was composing my approach to composing those two pieces was, um, I wanted to feel like, I wanted it to feel like sunshine. I wanted it to feel like a really beautiful spring day and, and then maybe uh, late spring or early summer, or you're just really enjoying being together, being outside and having a good comrade, you know, to chat things with and you might have a glass of wine with you <laughs> you know just something light um uh, i had a, a very dear friend tina who passed away suddenly a few years ago <clears throat> and i composed a piece called on the wings of faith for her to tribute to her and i only had a couple of weeks to get that done because i was also literally preparing her memorial and had to go down to florida to facilitate it but in that piece um i wanted to use piano and strings to um, express my deep appreciation for our friendship and to express my belief in our eternal spiritual bond. And so I, I, I started very simply because she's a very, she was a very gentle, compassionate, uh, kind person. And I built this, my idea was to build a climactic crescendo with an ascending range, like, you know, starting kind of medium range and then and then raising the pitch higher and higher with more climactic uh, drama with the strings to show or to kind of symbolize my friend's beautiful life state and our eternal bonds. So um, I'm kind of describing these to you because sometimes it's not about, you know, specifics um, in terms of music theory or music knowledge, but it's about what's in your heart when you go to the piano. What is it that you want to say? And that's what that's what I start with, and that's what I always come back to when I'm composing something. Um, when I've done musical theater songs, um, and I've used that that trick I mentioned earlier. I use uh, sometimes I've used a pop song, um, just using the lyrics from that pop song, and I'll take those lyrics and try to create my own melody um, and set the and those lyrics are great because they're they've already got a form. They've already got a rhythm. They've already got a structure. So if I follow that, some some really good, um, you know, quality pop song or jazz standard lyrics, then it's already given me a blueprint, and I'm just trying to create a melody to those lyrics. And then I'll get rid of the lyrics, and I'll um, sometimes put a chord progression under it. And I haven't always done that for all my musical theater songs, but um, that's one thing that I did. <clears throat> um for film scoring, I've, you know, for a couple of things, for example, I'm, uh, I did a horror film score and I did a rom-com film score. And just so you know, I'm a chicken. I, I, you know, when I got the horror films uh, from the director, I had to literally make the picture tiny and turn it way down so and stand way far away <laughs> so I wouldn't get freaked out looking at it. But I had to watch it over and over again. And so I did that to kind of get a, a grip on what's the story. So when I did, when I composed music for film, that, I, when I create that way, I'm thinking to be led by the story. So the other things that I mentioned, those were personal, you know, expressions for my dad, for my friends. <clears throat> when I composed for these films, you know, I was paid to do that for these people. So I had to support their idea. Um, and this is a great way to, to, to just use an idea like this and, and come up with ideas for yourself. But for example, for the horror film, um, I tried to think what sounds scary at the piano. So I used a lot of dissonance intervals, you know, that are close together, like minor seconds. 
you know, like <laughs> notes right next to each other. Um, really, really low range notes simultaneously with really, really high notes. So there's this big gap of range between them. Um, repeated things um, that kind of to build sus sus suspense or um, tension dynamically growing through these repetitive things, um, sometimes sustained things. Um, I used, I don't know if you've heard of John Carpenter, but for this horror film, the director wanted something kind of like John Carpenter. And so I just went and listened to it. And John Carpenter did some kind of like um, medium high range arpeggios that just repeated over and over again, a little theme. And so I did some of that. I, I tried to kind of emulate his style. Um, and and I used, as I mentioned, like really low bass piano notes, instrumentation. Then I would put a really high boy soprano voice with it. Um, and I used the percussion more percussively in, in the bass. Um, and then I would do some strings with tremolo or percussion effects. Now, I know we're... You know, we're not using the piano um, and we can't hear all these instruments at the piano. But I mean, if you've got a digital computer and you've got it or you've got a digital keyboard, these are things you can do. Just play around with these kinds of instrumentation ideas at the piano. For the rom-com, I let the, as, as I did with the horror film, I let the story guide me. So the rom-com story is funny and <clears throat> romance. So I wanted things not to be like the horror dissonant, scary, you know, sounds, but mellow and consonant and happy, like major keys. And um, I used strings and flute and piano chords and some silences and some if comedic effects with percussion instruments. <clears throat> so I still composed all of that at the piano. Um, so these are just ways that I've approached the piano. I just wanted to give you a little <laughs> overview of some different creative ideas. And like I said, I'll drop the links below for some of these examples that I talked about. Um, but I'm going to go check and see if you've got any questions. And that's, I hope that that was helpful to you. I hope that that gave you some, um, you know, good ideas to get started at the piano. And, oh, I see a question here from Rob. How do I choose my limitations? That's a great idea. I mean, great question. And his next question, how do you choose the time signature in which to compose? Well, I recommend um, <clears throat> pick one for one day and pick another for another day, you know, and just, you know, pick three, four time signature or six, eight time signature to do a triple meter like a waltz style. And another day do a, a duple meter like two, four or four, four common time, just because it's good to practice different styles, different feels. So it doesn't really matter. Pick one that you want to do and <laughs> do that one first. <laughs> and then how I choose my limitations. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, I think it depends on where you are, um, w you know, with your level and with um, how you feel creatively that day. Um, if I feel creating a whole form and structure blueprint is too demanding for me in the moment, um, then I let my creative uh, voice lead me. So I'll, I'll just do some real simple improvisational way. Um, but <clears throat> if you're a beginner or, um, you know, early intermediate, uh, I suggest to start with some of these ideas. Start with a very simple key like C major or A minor, something easy to digest, you know, so you don't have to think about what's in the key when you're trying to create something. And come up with a very simple, um, you know, um, you know, how am I trying to say, um, structure, four, four bars, followed by four bars of something different. And then repeat, uh, come back to the next four bars that repeat the first four bars. And then the next four bars are going to be similar to the, you know, the B section. So just start with something, um, wherever your level is. And if that's too, you know, mind boggling for you, then go back and do, um, just set a beat and, you know, s set a simple chord progression, write it down if you need to, and just practice it. And then do some of these rhythm ideas that we talked about at the beginning. The point is there is no right or wrong answer for what kind of limitations to choose. It's, 
you know, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't pick some, don't bite something off really challenging. Start with really simple things and give yourself the box that you need to start with. If you need a blueprint, you know, like I mentioned before, with a lot of more detail of the form and how many beats there are and what key it's going to change to. If you want to think that far in advance, go for it. If you need to start with improvising, then pick something simple and start really small and just practice improvising. I hope that, you know, makes sense. I just don't think there's a right or wrong answer. If you're tripping up over it, then I think you need to give yourself more limitations. And that's what I, that's what I meant by my, um, when I set a blueprint for myself, the reason I started doing that is because when I was composing, um, my music was, was too long winded and it was, there were no real clear melody themes. Um, there was a mood, but it was very rambling and I just felt stuck. It like wasn't a meaningful musical message. So I, that was me trusting my creative voice to say, okay, stop, give yourself limitations. And for me, what I needed at the level I was at was to create a song form, ABA, and decide how many bars there were going to be in each section first. That gave me kind of, it boxed me in, but within those limitations, it freed me up a lot. So I hope that makes sense, Rob. If, if it doesn't, ask me another question. I'll see if I can clarify it. And does anybody else have any other questions or comments on, um, you know, being creative or um, the ways that we talked about, you know, uh, composing at the piano? Let me know. And in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and drop these links and uh, I'll come back later too and um, see if you have any further questions. I'm going to drop the links in hopefully right now. There's a link to the blog about learning to be creative. If you want to see it in print, there's a link to the blog about the two different ways to compose at the piano, improvising versus creating a blueprint or limitations. And there's going to be a link to my music site where you can find, I'll list the names of the pieces I talked about today. So you can go listen to those and maybe kind of see what I was talking about with those creative approaches. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, if you want me to break it down any further, let me know. Good. I'm glad you understand, Rob. I see you. <laughs> um, and, you know, try it out and see, you know, how it works for you. And um, let me know. You know, keep me posted. If you're tripping up on something, um, you know, let me know that too. And, and nine times out of ten, if you are tripping up, there's usually two reasons for that. You're going too fast. Slow down. <laughs> or you're not really listening to yourself. You're... You, Go back to the first part of this live and think about your creative mindset and put yourself back in that space because there are no right or wrong answers. There are no, you know, mistakes. As Bob Ross, the painter says, there are only happy accidents. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed this and I hope you're getting something out of it. And if you um, have any further questions or comments or tips on composing at the piano, please hurl it at me and um, I'll drop some uh, links. Hopefully I got everything down there and check them out. And let me know how it goes. And I'm going to go back and uh, 